Hi everybody, this is Crypto Rich, working with you to get rich with crypto, filling our pockets with crypto profits. And in this video, we're going to be finding out that everything you ever wanted to know about Bitcoin, but were afraid to ask, including some really, really dodgy, on the edge, controversial issues with regards to Bitcoin. Take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. Got oh, crypto? Got a hardware wallet to keep your crypto safe? Then you have to have one of these to keep your CPRA safe. The Keystone tablet is fireproof, waterproof. You can use it to store 12 word, 18 word, 15 word, 24 word seed phrases. It comes with a full set of letters and everything you need to make sure that your seed phrase never gets destroyed or disappeared. Get one, get two, get three, have multiple copies. Use my affiliate link in the description below. If you want to keep up with some of the craziness that's going on in the world, then subscribe to Ryland Media's Twitter account, twitter.com slash Ryland Media. Before I introduce my guest, Ashling Olochlin, I've already said her name. And we, this is our second conversation, second of many, I hope. Please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, CryptoRichYT, join my official Telegram announcements channel, and please come over to Odyssey, bit.ly slash CryptoRichOdyssey, where I post additional stuff, and I'm not censored like I am on YouTube. And this video is going to go on your channel as well, I think, Ashling, at some point. Yes, well, what, what's left of it? Every time I put something up, it gets banned or censored or nobody can comment. They're watching me. I've only put around three up. I'm like, come on, lads. It, but I'll it, certainly it, put it, it up on Telegram. Okay, is this on YouTube? Your YouTube? YouTube, yeah, it's really weird because I kind of had private stuff and then I'd, the odd time I'd put a, a video up and then it would get banned. Okay, Odyssey. Odyssey and Rumble. And Odyssey, Odyssey and Rumble will grab the videos from YouTube and then post them. And then with Odyssey, you can earn some crypto, which I know you, you know everything about crypto, right? Well, I'm so suspicious of you, Carissa. I'm like, when, when I heard crypto, a rich, crypto rich, I was like, hmm, crypto, I can't trust this guy. He's got crypto in his name. So, but then I got talking to you and somebody said, wait a second, this guy's really sound. And I'm like, but he's got crypto in his name. Wait a second. We're supposed to be saying cash is king. Um, we're supposed to be deadly suspicious of crypto because that's the way they can control us. The controllers, they're already doing a very good job of it. Uh, but then I thought, no, no, check yourself a minute. Now, I haven't a rashers about money, okay, in general. I'm pretty terrible. So it doesn't really matter about cash is king or crypto, or whatever way you look at it. I suppose I've never been that interested in it. And it's never been that interested in me. So now I've kind of reached the age of 44 and I'm thinking, I, I better get interested because this is actually getting a bit serious. My disinterest in money. Uh, I need stuff, you know. I, I'd love I love a world where we don't need it. I'd love to live in a world where we could break free of the money matrix and we could just magic stuff up, 5D style. I was just reading the Bible earlier and Jesus is like, you can just, you know, five loaves, two fishes, just, I'm like, I just don't know how to do that. But if I could do that, I would. But I've come back around going, I'm going to have to figure out money somehow or another. So that's why I really want to talk to you about crypto. Um, it definitely has a bad rap, doesn't it? It really does now. But then I've been looking at certain people who I admire. and They're talking about Bitcoin. They're talking about crypto. I'm like, OK, hold up the horse. Let's find out. So talk to me like the dummy I am. And I really am a dummy when it comes to it. Um, should we be suspicious of crypto? Let's just start with that, Rich. Should we be suspicious of crypto? Yes. Mm. Yes. And, but that doesn't mean don't investigate, don't inquire. Okay. Um, I was suspicious of a certain medical treatment, and I inquired, and I didn't. And, and as a result of my inquiry, I chose not to have that intervention. Thank bloody goodness. Mm -hmm. And also, um, you said it has a bad rap. It has a bad rap. It certainly has a bad rap in the mainstream media. But then. One of the rule of thumbs that I've developed over the last few years, if the mainstream media smears it, oh, I should pay attention to it. I should, you know, this Corbyn, Trump, Orban, you know, the th three people who are advocating for peace and the media smear them. Oh, I should listen to them. Right. So uh, that's a useful, you know, and, and then certain doctors that they've smeared and stuff. So I think that's a useful rule of thumb if the media smear it. Right. Um but, and I want to take it back and please interrupt me because in case I get okay. or anything, mm -hmm. right? But um, consider that money is tokenized energy. So you, so imagine you're a cobbler and you spend an hour 
building some really, making some really fine leather shoes for me. Handcrafted, you bought the leather and everything, you sewed it all up. Now, you've got to be able to exchange that energy and that experience and that knowledge in order to get something else. Now, you could come to me with, your, with the shoes and say, hey, listen, Rich, I know you've got loads of potatoes. I need some potatoes. So we'll do a deal. Now you've got the potatoes and I've got the shoes. You eat the potatoes. You come back a week later. You offer me another pair of shoes. I don't need another pair of shoes. Those shoes you made are really mm. great, right? Um, so no, no potatoes for you. So what money does, it serves as a unit of exchange. It's that energy, that effort, that knowledge that you, you, we can then use. You could give me an hour's worth, a token that represents that hour of skill and effort. And then I can take that. Had something gone very wrong with the whole thing. I was uh, reading a great article from a journalist called John Waters the other day. He was talking about the corrupting influence of fake money. Yes. And there seems to be some kind of magic money machine and all sorts of people who don't deserve it, who don't have the talent to make good shoes, you know, um, I seem to be getting rich quick overnight. And, you know, you can't help but be a bit like, OK, what's going on here? And the way things are divided, it's so unfair. People are greedy when it comes to, to the fake money. They'll do anything. They'll say anything. They'll sell their soul for it to get their hands on it. Um, but the thing with the crypto, and this is my concern, is it's who's in charge of the buttons, who's pressing the buttons. Okay. Um, Somebody like me, if I start saying something that the government doesn't like and they see it as hate speech or I'm far right or I'm a conspiracy theorist or it's misinformation, that whoever's twiddling those buttons can say, well, we're just turning off her money. And that's my issue with crypto. Yeah. Well, I think you've got um, you may have an uh, confused crypto with CBDCs. Hmm. So central. Okay. I probably are, have. Yeah. They're yeah. centralized. Bitcoin is decentralized. But OK. People watching. I want to. Um, just just cover some basics about money right now the the, okay. the the exchange transfer traditionally has been gold and silver gold silver is gold and silver are money and bitcoin i'm asserting is also money the fake money let's call that currency and that's the one that the pounds and the dollars and the euros and the yen and the yuan and the ruble that governments can just press a few digits on a computer and print more, digitally print more, digitally print more. And then what happens is that your, your hour of effort is devalued. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a phenomenon within financial circles known as the Cantillion effect, that those who are nearest the spigot, the money spigot, have the most advantage. So if I had a gold mine, well, I'd have more advantage than, some, than a retail purchaser of gold sovereigns. Because I'm right near the source of the gold. Same with silver, same with Bitcoin mining. But I can't magic up more gold than there is. I mm -hmm. can't magic up more silver. I can't magic up more Bitcoin. It's a limited supply. But I can magic now, wait. up more dollars. I, I, I can understand with silver, with gold. But Bitcoin, you could magic that up with a few. We could just twiddle the button. Can you not? Nope. I mean, can nope. some little nerd manage nope. to do that? Nope. Really? Oh, yeah, it's decent. Okay. Is this a blockchain right? thing, is it? Yeah, it's this... a blockchain thing. And I'll come to what that is, but I just want to say what okay. the foundation of money is, right? But what the governments are doing, you know, with COVID-19 and, and trillion and all the debt and everything, right, is they, they press money, they press a button, the Cantillion effect, the large money makers, the central banks, the banks, and, and they can just create money. They just they just create currency. They just create currency. So they increase the supply of this tokenized energy, but they haven't done the work. And when you increase the supply of something, the value of it goes down, you know, and that's what happens. That's why I remember when I first came to this country in 1970, a shop, a, sh a full shopping trolley for us for a week, family of five, five quid. Now a Five week, quid? Five what? quid. How are you shopping? Yes, in 1970. Now, 150 quid. And it's not because... Oh, it's not like the can of Coke has changed value, although I don't drink Coke, right? But the purchasing power of the pound has gone down because the value of the pound has gone down because I need more pounds to purchase. Well, this is what's it. happening. You know, people are getting, especially the younger generation, are getting somewhat despondent. You know, the chances of being able to buy a house seem to be out of reach. Uh, you need to be earning, in Ireland, you need to be earning at least over 80 grand, which is a huge sum of money to be earning. And that's just to pay a mortgage, buy the groceries, 
pay the car insurance and just survive. A lot of people aren't earning that. There's a good few in the NGOs who are earning it, but then look what they're pumping out. Yes. So it all seems to be wrong. Everything seems to be on its head and wrong. And then there's this despondency and people don't even want to work because they're also getting free money from the government. So when you introduce the free money aspect as well, it's like, well, what's the point in working? Uh, and then, okay, let me just add to this. Mm -hmm. We have the the so-called the fake UGs, the refugees um, situation. So these guys come in and then they are top of the queue uh, in the social welfare system. And then there's more money being magicked up. We don't know how uh, for these guys. And then we have our government ministers in Ireland saying, well, Ireland's one of the richest countries in the world. It's got a massive debt, but apparently we're one of the richest countries in the world and we should be sharing. And don't be so cruel and don't be so mean. So this is kind of the, the guilt trip just before save granny and, you know, do your bit. The guilt yep. trip again is, but we're rich and we should share. Uh, yep. Thoughts, please. Yes. Well, we covered this in our video last last week. The the refugee crisis. This ill. But and just that, where's the money coming from? Is well, it more the currency, money angle? It's currency. They're just printing it. Look, if you imagine you and I are central bankers, and we yeah. can just press a button and produce more current, produce more pounds, produce more euros. How tempting is that? Right. And then with those euros, I can then purchase more things. But I'm increasing the supply. But because of the Cantillion effect that you and I as central bankers are right at the source, the spigot, we have the most advantage. So we get the money first with the currency first, and then we can spend it and assign it however we wish. And it's the people at the bottom of the economic ladder who are hit the hardest. And then yeah, so they to buy favors. So if I'm able yeah. to print currency, at will as much, right? I can give this much money to RTE, I can give this much money to BBC, and then they will tow the editorial line that I want them to tow. Well, this is what's happening. And we see then the damaging effect of it all. Yeah. Um, because I would say the guys in charge don't have their best interests at heart. But, you know, there is just the temptation of getting rich quick. And uh, there is that corrupting influence, that corrupting force of money, uh, which is why you just kind of, this is why I'll step back from it. I'm like, I, you know, I don't, I see bad things happening here. I don't know if I'm interested in this. So how would you win me over <laughs> to be interested in money? <laughs> I wouldn't win you over. I wouldn't win you over. But I, again, I just want to be poor, okay? <laughs> the distinction between money, gold, silver, mm. and Bitcoin, yeah. and currency, which is fake. And if you look on your euro, certainly on the pound and the dollar, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of. Well, the sum of what? It's just a promise to pay. Pay what? It's an IOU note, but it's not backed by anything. I promise to, it's a, I'm going to pay you something at some point. What? Right? Now, it was backed by gold. It was backed by silver. But Nixon changed that in 1971 because he wanted to keep printing more dollars in order to fund the killing of Vietnamese people. Which which fake money, which currency allows you to do? You can print, 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 print. You can't do that with gold, silver, or Bitcoin. That's all it's, in that book. It's all in that book, it's which book. I haven't read, by the way. I've heard great things about. It's the creature from Jekyll Island by G. Yeah. Edward Griffin. So on the, my Telegram channel, we have great conversations, and this book just keeps coming up. And I'm told I have to read it. And because I'm just kind of shocking with finance, like it's a really good book, actually. It's very interesting, even for people like me who tried to sit through economics before and couldn't bear it because I just thought they're talking gobbledygook. But now I realize I was right. Economics is gobbledygook. But this is this is great. This is a very good book. Uh, and what you're saying there all about silver or the gold backed dollar and why it's changed. It's all in there. It's and it's a fascinating read, but it shows you why why we're in this boom bust cycle. Yep. And why the taxpayer always has to dole out the banks. Yep. So we're in a kind of a hoax, another hoax of a system. But yet it benefits so many people, I suppose, that people don't really care. What do you reckon? Well, well I don't know. I think it, we're not educated about it because I wasn't taught mm. about it in school. But by the way, my son, who's now 19, he bought his fir first Bitcoin when he was 11. But then he was home educated. Right. So <laughs> he's done really well. Now, the, the creature from Jekyll from Jekyll Island chronicles I, how this fiat currency system was set up by the banksters to benefit themselves at the cost yes. of everybody else. And then what happens is, you know, you're working hard as a cobbler. It takes you 30 hours concentrated work a week to feed your family and have a little bit extra and everything, right? Keep living. However, as a central bankster, I can press a button and I can produce more of these fake 
currency tokens, thus devaluing the time and effort and skill that you've put into it. You now to need to work 60 hours a week to keep the same standard of living because I've inflated the supply. I've increased the supply of the fake currency just by pressing buttons. You can't do that with gold. You can't do that with silver. And you can't do that with Bitcoin. Now, but is it, does it all depend on who's in charge of the Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin? Does it all no. depend on who's running the show? Yes and no. So with gold and silver, people who, the miners have a particular advantage. Large holders have a particular advantage. Um, I could say that the population of India has a particular advantage because they have something like, they have more gold than any other central bank. With the possible exception of China. I have heard accounts that China has 40,000 tons of gold that they're keeping quiet about, right? Mm. They don't export any. They're one of the largest um, producers of gold and they import loads through Hong Kong. And this guy estimated 40,000 tons is what they have. Now, gold is the foundation of all money. All money boils down to gold, whether it's dollars or euros or yen or Bitcoin or silver. It's all measured against gold. Gold is the ultimate form of money. So in terms of a control, those that have the most amount, well, they have a certain advantage, you know, in crypto circles, we call them whales, the large holders, because that's always the case, right? However, gold so, is pretty well dispersed. Are you better off just getting your hands on some gold? So rather gold, silver, and forget about Bitcoin or the crypto. Well, here's what I say. Mm. And this is not financial advice. Hedge your bets, diversify, have gold, have silver, have Bitcoin, have privacy cryptos, which we will come to and have cash, yeah. right? Diversify. Okay. Okay. And if you don't, uh, you know, have money to lose, you know, a lot of the time they say, you know, with crypto, um, have it to lose. But so if you don't, don't have money to lose. Don't put in any more than you can afford to lose. Then, yeah. then either don't do it or try, just try a little. You know, just okay. try a little. You know, my, my son didn't buy a lot when he was 11. He was only 11. And how's he doing now? So how did that investment go? <laughs> He's still got that Bitcoin. <laughs> it but did it, did it make any money for him? Did it return a yield? It's, it doesn't give a yield, just like gold doesn't give a yield or silver doesn't give a yield, but it preserves its value. Gold is always gold. Silver is always silver. Bitcoin is always Bitcoin. And it can't be printed. And I'll come to that. Now, gold is pretty well dispersed. Gold is okay. recognized pretty much in any society that uses any form of money or currency. They will take gold. And if, if you don't think the gold in your pocket has any value, you could send it to me. I'll take it. No problem. Right. Now, I do notice in Europe, apart from maybe Germany and Austria, people don't get the value of gold. Not like they do in Africa or South America or Asia. You know, there they really get the value of gold. Right. Then uh, now gold, you wouldn't use gold for regular transactions because it's too valuable. I think a sovereign is, I, I haven't looked for a few for a few weeks or so, a sovereign might be 400 euros, a gold sovereign. A gold sovereign is the most liquid gold coin in the world, thanks to the British Empire. And it has a value of about 400 pounds, 400 euros, something like that, right? You wouldn't use that to go and buy milk. You yeah. might use silver, which has been used as money more often than gold and is much, much cheaper. And um, a gold Britannia, beautiful, silver Britannia, beautiful coin, has a, I think, a silver value of maybe about $25. Right? You've so got the Queen's you, mug on that, though, don't you? <laughs> it's going to be Charles' mug no, no. soon. How awful. It's a beautiful coin. It's such a beautiful coin. Mm. Then you've got Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is fully decentralized. You, you know about file sharing, BitTorrent. You know, you can get pirated yep. videos and stuff like that. You know, they spent hundreds oh, yeah. of years hundreds of millions of dollars trying to stop it, but they haven't been able to. Yeah. I, Pirate Bay is banned in, the website is banned in Britain. But people can still access Pirate Bay through mirrors, through using a VPN, and you can download files. Why they've not been able to capture Bit, the BitTorrent system is because it's fully decentralized. Bitcoin uses this, is a development of the same code. It is decentralized. Okay, what about who owns the internet? That's always the big question of who owns the internet and whoever owns, the, I mean, is it Google? Does Google own the internet? Uh, I don't know. Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, who owns the internet? I don't know. What, I don't what know. is the internet? I don't know. I can't tell you. It's like, you're asking me like, what? I was listening to What is a Woman earlier on today. <laughs> That's up <laughs> there with What is a Woman. Oh, uh, who owns the internet? Whoever identifies as the, as the owner of the internet owns the internet. <laughs> I don't know. But, but it's communication yeah. channels. It's all these servers and these computers talking to each other, right? Yeah. And that's the deal with Bitcoin. There, you have all these computers and what they do, 
the, it's, it's a list of transactions. Ashling sent one Bitcoin to Crypto Rich, who sent one Bitcoin to so-and-so, who sent half a Bitcoin to somebody else, who sent half a Bitcoin to Thingamibob, right? So it's all those transactions added mm. on, added on, added on. That's the blockchain. And the way that it works, that every single computer has the same copy of the blockchain. So you've no privacy then? You can't be like up to dodgy business. Not, not that I'd want to be up to dodgy of business, course. but what, one couldn't be up to dodgy business. With Bitcoin, you can't. It is a public, yeah. transparent um, ledger. Everybody can see it. But because mm. it's so decentralized, it can't be captured by any central entity. And it has the advantage over gold and silver that it's portable. I could send you some Bitcoin and you can have it in your account in 10 minutes. It's there. How am I gonna so what can you more? buy with this? What well, can you buy with Bitcoin? Currently, uh, in and this may change, right, is I, I have a crypto.com debit card. I can load Bitcoin onto that debit card. It converts it to pounds or wherever the visa sign is accepted, and I can make purchases. I, there are other ways. Um, I know Expedia, Dell Computers, uh, more and more companies are taking cryptocurrency as, pay, as forms of payment because have a, what do you you and I know that the pound and the euro and the dollar is losing value? They're printing it away. What are we going to do? Well, I'm not going to park my pounds, my money in the bank because mm. interest rates are going up, but the in inflation is even higher. So my pounds are losing purchasing power. Well, I could put it in gold and silver and Bitcoin, and then I've got liquidity. I can use it. I can transact with it. I'm also then outside of the CBDC matrix. If I'm so. With Would you tell me what's the difference with, between Bitcoin and the CDBD matrix? What's okay, the difference? So the CBDC matrix is centralized; it's controlled. There's okay. the, the the government or whoever runs. Well, I suppose it'll be the government, right? They will have complete say. It, it's a bit like the um, the difference between, say, cash and the banking system. You know, I bank with this bank. Let's say I bank with I, know, I bank with I don't know any bank, right? I bank with any bank, and then I send money to you to your any bank account. That's a closed system and it's controlled mm. by any bank and it might connect with other banks, but it's still a controlled closed system managed centrally by another party. There's this thing called uh, counterparty risk, which is that the holder of the money, I don't hold the money, somebody else does, is holding it on my behalf. And with CBDCs, who has control over it will be the, the issuer. The governments or the and right. I think that's a big issue, isn't it? Because people are confusing the two. Once you hear yeah. crypto, you think of that, and then you think, well, no, that's just too risky. Why would I do that? So, I mean, it's a big kind of education to try and inform the public, uh, you know, that there's a difference here between Bitcoin. And were you just going with Bitcoin, or are there other types of there, there are others? There are others, and we'll come to those in a second, right? But gold, silver, and Bitcoin are decentralized. If I have gold in my pocket or silver or Bitcoin in my pocket, there's no counterparty risk. The money in my, the currency in my bank account, there's counterparty risk because I'm counting on the bank to be on, to be honorable with me. I'm uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm counting on the government to not inflate the supply away. If I put the gold in a vault in a bank, I'm counting that on the bank not being robbed or the government not enforcing regulations that allow them to seize that gold. There's counterparty risk. If I give you my gold, Ashling, I'm counting on you not to run away with it and to return it when I ask you. I'd right? give it back to you. I would. That, that's very good. That's very good of you. But but there's still a counterparty risk. Yeah. Now with Bitcoin, the whole and with gold and silver, there isn't that counterparty risk. If I hold it, I own it. If I don't hold it, I don't own it. So it gets rid of the counterparty risk. With CBDCs, there's always counterparty risk. What they've done, what they're doing, the WEF and their acolytes. They're taking the blockchain technology to create a system of control that would allow them to have control over how we spend our money and how we transact and how we engage in commerce. They use, now, Bitcoin is a very simple form of cryptocurrency. It is just, it's digital gold. That's all it is, digital gold or digital silver. Because there's still a risk, isn't there? You know, if you have a load of silver and, and gold in the house or under the bed or you know, buried in a hole somewhere, that somebody could just come along and nick it. Yep. Same. That's there, it. Yeah, there is. And it's not portable. Like if I want to go to another country, I've got to carry the gold or the silver with me. If I mm. want to go to another country, 
I can take my Bitcoin with me without taking my Bitcoin. It's like my e it's like my like an email account. I don't have to have Could it all be wiped account. though? If if somebody gets in charge of the internet and then just presses a button somewhere and then, then you don't have access to it, do you know? That's yeah. also a concern. There, there are some risks to it. So one is if the if the governments close off all the um what I call fiat on ramps and off ramps, like mm. all the, the gateways, the connections between that Bitcoin and okay. Fine, then I think there'll just be an alternative economy with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. The other is if they make it harder and harder to access the websites, mm -hmm. but then they've not been able to get to BitTorrent. You know, they've not been able to get rid of that. It's decentralized. People can use VPNs. You know, governments have banned Bitcoin and people still transact with Bitcoin. Governments banning something doesn't mean people stop engaging in it. You know, governments have banned murder and marijuana. Not the two are necessarily. I wouldn't put the two in the same category. That's but, right. Yeah. But they've banned marijuana and people still transact and deal with marijuana. So Now, listen, let's just look at the best case scenario. So everybody decides, OK, let's try a bit of Bitcoin or crypto or whatever one they want to go for, as opposed to the CBDC uh, centralized system. Uh, so you create this kind of parallel society. Um, what freedoms would you have if you went for Bitcoin over the sea? DC. Well, no one's going to take the no one's going to take the Bitcoin out my wallet, and there's that mm. risk with CBDCs. No one's going to punish me because with CBDCs they can program them. They can't program Bitcoin; it's not programmable. There are other cryptocurrencies that are programmable money, and CBDC will be programmable money. You have exceeded your carbon allowance, so we're going to take, we're going to yeah. find you. You have left your 15 minute zone, so we're going to take some more out. From your from the CBDC wallet, you have eaten far too much beef this week, so we're not enough bugs. So we're going to take some more out for you. Can't do that with Bitcoin. Can't do that with gold. Can't do that with silver. It takes more effort. Now th th you can't do that with cash either. Here's the great thing about cash: cash is completely private, completely completely private. You know, you and I meet up and stuff, and you give me a hundred euros, or I give you a hundred quid. Nobody knows. We can do it completely privately. However, it doesn't translate over distances. Bitcoin does, and privacy cryptocurrencies do. Now, before I go into them, okay. gold mm -hmm. is, has limited supply. Now, there may be loads and loads of gold on the planet, in the sea. There may be loads of gold in the asteroids. But in terms of the actual available supply, it's a diminishing return. I think something like less than 1% is added every year. And the gold mines in South Africa are more than two miles deep. And they have to go through tons and tons and tons of rocks just to get an ounce of gold. So it's scarce. Scarcity gives it value. Silver is not as scarce as gold, which is why it doesn't command the same prices as silver. However, silver could get more scarce because it is the second most used industrial commodity after oil. Silver's in your clothes. And tell me this, because I know people who've invested in silver and gold and they're waiting and they're waiting and it's like, it's, they're, they're nearly wasting their life. You know, it's just like waiting for it to go up in value. And sometimes I'm like, this waiting game is going on too long, uh, you know? I mean, how long should you wait before gold goes up or the price of silver goes up? It kind of seems a bit sad in its own way. You know, it's kind of another thing. It's like, that's there a bit is tragic a gold, waiting all that time. The gold and silver price as measured in fake currency it's there's a fraud going on and people yeah. don't know about this fraud necessarily so gold and silver are both traded as as currencies on the foreign exchange market which is the largest market in the world trillions of dollars traded every day i think seven trillion dollars every day right so you can move millions and millions of dollars, sell your dollars and buy gold, sell your gold and buy dollars. But you're not really dealing with the actual physical stuff. It's just digits on a screen that represent the physical stuff. Except the banksters print fake digital gold to keep the price of gold low. They and do you think it will ever be busted, that hoax? Yes. Do you think one day we'll have the I true think so. value of gold? I think so. There have been three and a half, over 3,500 fiat currencies, i.e. currencies issued by governments. Every single one has gone to zero. Every single one. Because governments cannot resist the temptation of printing more. And that's what that's yeah. what they're doing right now. All they're doing is printing more, printing more, printing more, printing more. And then they keep printing more digital gold and digital silver to make the price of gold and silver look bad. So people don't go and invest in it, go, don't go and buy it. 
probably what they're doing themselves is printing more fiat currency, more fake currency to buy up physical gold and silver before everybody else does, right? Every single fiat currency has gone to zero. Gold and silver have never gone to zero. Never, ever, ever. And did I hear correct that the World Economic Forum and the Federal Reserve aren't exactly um, in cahoots, that they have their own little arguments and discussions as well? They do have their own. Now, this is a theory promulgated by my friend, Tom Luongo. Mm. Tom Luongo.me, go check him out. He's a regular on my channel and I listen to all his stuff. And for over, I think over 18 months now, he's been saying the Federal Reserve and the WEF are at war. The WEF wants central bank digital currencies. Central bank digital currencies will mean the end of commercial banking. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, who are shareholders in the Federal Reserve, because it's, fe it's not federal, it's privately owned by six banks. JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, they don't want to lose their share of the business. They're not going to get cut out. They're like, who are these WEF gangsters with their CBDCs coming onto our turf? No. So then what they've been doing is raising interest rates, raising interest rates, raising interest rates, mm -hmm. which strengthens the dollar, but drains mm -hmm. capital out of the European Union. Mm -hmm. The EU is in such great shape. It's such great shape that from 2014 to 2022, they had negative interest rates. That is upside down money. And it's it's because their financial system is so is in such dire straits, they can't afford the repayments on their debts. So they had to add negative interest rates. And what happens is the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, raises interest rates, it is bankrupting the European Union. Because mm. how are they gonna make the repayments? They can't make the repayments when it was 0%. How are they gonna manage on, I don't know what it is now, two and a half, three, four percent 4%. And that how come German bonds are better value than American bonds? That makes no sense. Germany's going into recession. They don't have cheap energy. They've got no way of reviving their economy. They're screwed. And they're holding up the rest of the moribund EU nations. So, but, um, This is the bit that catches me, though. You know, if I, when I'm out and about and I see everybody's out for dinner and I see people driving around in nice cars, living a very high standard of living, and then I think, am I just being a negative Nancy here? Maybe I just need to put my head in and, you know, forget about it. Now, not that I'm ever going to do that, but it does go through my mind sometimes. I'm like, well, People don't seem to be affected one way or the other. They seem to be quite happy and just worried about what they're going to eat. It seems to be the main concern. It's what they're having for their dinner. I think people are affected. I think people who have this nice, fine lifestyle and stuff, a lot of them are in debt. They're just racking up their credit cards. And at some point, that will all collapse and interest rates are going up. So then the mortgage repayments are going up. The cost of fuel is going up. Everything goes up when interest rates go up. And at the same time, the government's increasing the fiat supply. So what you earn, what I earn, is going to buy me less and less and less and less. So we're, we are being driven to poverty, which is what the WEF want, right? And we get to a state where like, please, please, please rescue us with your CBDCs, except this is where cryptocurrencies can be our salvation. Gold, silver, Bitcoin. Now, I just, one thing I want to say about Bitcoin, right? Why they can't control it. It's important for people to understand. There isn't the computing power in the world to capture you 51% of the computing power of Bitcoin because Bitcoin gets generated by a computer algorithm. In order to change the code, you need to capture 51% of the computing power that there is in the world. There isn't enough computing power. It's like trying to destroy ants' nests throughout the world. You cannot do it. You might destroy all the ants' nests in, your, in the field where you are, Ashley, but you can't get rid of ants. You just can't. They're all over the place. They're decentralized. That's Bitcoin. Now, a couple of things. Yeah, that you I feel, I'm still a little bit. There. I'm just seeing somebody with a button turning off the internet. Yeah, you know, they could do that. The internet off. They could do that. And, and two then, things will happen. Where's your Bitcoin? Yeah, there's, we're hit, there's a problem, right? One is that if they turn off the internet, they lose the control mechanism. How do they control us without internet? Mm. Two, I've got more immediate problems. Is the water going to come out my tap? Are the traffic lights going to get going to work? Are there going to be deliveries of petrol to the local gas petrol station? I have more immediate concerns if they turn off the internet, right, than I do about my Bitcoin. But when they turn it back on, guess what? Bitcoin's still there. It's still there. <laughs> you know, it's like you turn off, you, you know, at night, you can't see the ants' nests. They've all gone. Mm -hmm. On the daytime, there they are. Hello. <laughs>
Now, well, I'm they, just thinking, you know, the Federal Reserve, the World Economic Forum, two enemies of the people, really and truly, when you look at, you know, what they're about. So there is this possibility, a bit of a glimmering hope that we could set up our own parallel society, step off the chessboard, say, well, I'm not getting involved in either or Federal Reserve or World Economic Forum, go our own way and try and wriggle free from the control grid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's a de- it's a decentralized form of money. It's a it's a decentralized form of value exchange that cannot be captured by a centralized entity. Now, a couple of questions that I've had that you haven't asked me, right? That pe- I've heard people say in, in the Truth or in the Wake movement, right? Well, it was invented by the CIA, you know, because nobody knows who invented it. Some guy or guys or group of people called Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows who that might be. Release the code, 2009, January, off it goes. Could it have been the CIA? Possibly. Who knows? It's open source code. The code is completely open source. It has been checked and checked and checked and checked. There are no back doors. It's open source. That's it. So that's what how you What does that mean? What does open source mean that you can check? It means that everybody can look at the computer code. Anybody, you know, you and I could look at it, make no sense to us, right? But any programmer or coder can look at the computer code and actually see whether there are any back doors or not, whether any places where, you know, someone can squirrel something away or insert something. It's open source code. You can't do it. Everybody can see. If somebody makes a change to the, to the code, the other computers will reject that copy. They'll reject that amended version. Can you cash it in? Can you cash in Bitcoin at all? Yeah. I, like I told you, that's one way, one way I do it is, is like that. Yeah. Is to, you know, there are other services and providers that will buy and sell, and it does depend upon your jurisdiction. And, um, but otherwise, if they ever close off those, um, those gateways to fiat, well, people can transact with it privately. Could you buy a house with it? Could you buy a car? You know, the, the, the important things. It's, it has been done. It has been done. Yeah. You know, in Dubai, people have purchased property with Bitcoin. It depends upon the local jurisdiction, but it might be then, okay, we'll convert the Bitcoin to, to the local currency and then purchase it. You know, you could do that. So, so that's the thing about the, the CIA and the code. The code, if the mm. code is changed, you know, you change the code on your computer, all the other computers will reject the change and they'll keep going with the original unless you can change the code on 51% of the computers and nobody has that amount of computing power. Then the other question, thing that I've heard, oh, it's a Ponzi scheme. Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. And mm. I don't think people really have understood and looked into the structure of Bitcoin. It has a finite supply. The real Ponzi is fiat currency because they just keep producing more. Bitcoin has a final. I hear time and time again about Bitcoin that there was a time to get in on it and that time has passed. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, fine. I, do you no, know, but, actually, yeah. actually, people there was, a, there was this it. moment where you could have got rich quick with it and now that moment's passed. Yes. Ashley, I mean, it's all double dutch to me. People shouldn't listen to me. I am just a social worker. I have cousins who work in banking in, in the city of London, banker cousins. And I first bought Bitcoin in 2013, and I told them about it. And they said, niyar, niyar, kush niyar, it won't go to anything. Don't, don't, don't. I said the same in 2017. I said the same in 2019, right? I've done really, really well. So it's never too late against, because we can't rely on the fiat currency. We know that's losing value because they're printing it away. Now, is Bitcoin going so to be... So tell going- us your story with it, though, Rich. Sorry. How like, how has it worked for you? I paid off my Just mortgage. Just a little I, overview. I paid off my mortgage last year. There was no way on a social worker's salary I would have paid off my mortgage. No way. It wasn't possible. My, you know, my children are home educated, which meant that uh, we have been, certainly when they were young, a single income family. So then I, ha- I would work, I would go to London on a Monday morning early Monday morning, come back on a Friday evening, sleep on cousins' floors because I could earn more money in London as a social worker than I could where I live. And this is so my wife wouldn't have to work. We're a a single-income family. But, you know, the kids, being with the kids and their education was way more important than them being in these, in in a factory school, right, being turned out to be like every other kid. And by with when what's going on now with children, I'm so glad they never went to school, right? They're now 15 and 19. We got, you know, almost 19, we got some more freedom. So that was a big deal. I've also helped out loads and loads of my friends and family. 
you know, I've got a very good friend of mine. I set her up with a particular cryptocurrency project, which I tried out and worked really, really well. And it helped her pay for her mother's care home fees. I've got a cousin in Pakistan. I introduced him to Bitcoin in, I think, 2019. I told him about it. He didn't do anything. And then he came back in December 2020. He said, OK, I'm interested. He is now working for a cryptocurrency project earning $2,000 a month in Pakistan. So, you know. OK, so how would somebody start? You know, if somebody said, all right, I'm going to give this a whirl, I'm going to give it a shot. Why not? Well, I would say. How would you begin? One, it's they uh, they should educate themselves and then consider it is a completely different paradigm of money. Now, I think, Ashley, you speak French, right? Well, I try very try. badly. Okay. All right, well, let me try. I, I do try. You do try. Yeah. Well, let me say it this way, right? There are there are jokes in Urdu that don't translate to English. They're just not funny in English, but they're really funny in Urdu and probably vice versa. Or when I go to Pakistan, it's a complete different experience to being in Britain to being in the US, it's a different paradigm. So what works in Bitcoin doesn't work with fiat currency. It doesn't work with gold and silver. So you have to learn the new rules, the way that it operates. So the first thing I would say is people need to educate themselves. You know, go to, I don't wanna say this, actually go to a good quality search engine like DuckDuckGo or Presearch, right? Or the Brave browser or something, right? and start educating yourself about money, about currency, about Bitcoin, and then go and buy a little, try it out. But don't put it- play. In, you just play, right? Don't put any more than you can afford to lose. And it is incredibly volatile, incredibly volatile. So where the dividends pay off is in the long term. You know, it's nothing for Bitcoin to drop 7% in a day. And me and my wife are like, oh, hum. Meanwhile, my cousins are just panicking because if the stock market drops a percent, that's a big deal. No, it's just Bitcoin. It's just 7%. Okay. It's incredibly volatile, right? But so I, the, something else I want to say about the Ponzi scheme, it's, it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's limited supply like gold. You can't increase the supply. And the, the amount of supply like gold diminishes over time, the amount of new supply. Same thing is happening with Bitcoin. It's programmed in. Right now, who's every, released it? Who, who owns it? Who's, who's releasing who Bitcoin? The code, the decentralized code. It's like who owns ants? They're just there doing anti things, right? So the code is just on these computers, algorithm being run, and every 10 minutes, six and a quarter Bitcoins are born. And then in 2024, around about April 2024, it'll reduce to three and an eighth every 10 minutes for four years. That's in the code, can't be changed. Okay. If it's changed, then it's right. So it's, it's, it's so it's a now, lifeline of sorts. So like we, it is we a lifeline. A lifeline at this but point. This yeah. privacy cryptos, privacy cryptos. Mm -hmm. So if you send Bitcoin from your Bitcoin account, known as a wallet, to my Bitcoin account, known as a wallet, that transaction can be seen. That from this address, it won't have your name on it. It's a series of characters and numbers. 10 Bitcoin, Ashley, feeling very generous, sent crypto rich, 10 Bitcoin. Went from that address to this address at this amount of time. And then that 10 Bitcoin stayed in that account for a while. And then three of it went to another account. And you've just gone sideways. And now you've disappeared. Ooh, oh, I'm you. back again. All right. Sorry. Okay. So what was the last thing you heard? Um, you were talking about Bitcoin. Uh, let me see. Totally. Okay. Okay, so the Bitcoin transactions can be seen publicly by anybody. You can go to a Bitcoin, what's called a Bitcoin blockchain explorer, and you can see the transactions going from this wallet to that wallet and this wallet to wallet. That, therefore, it's possible to track them, and it's possible through data analytics to connect them to particular people, to particular accounts through exchanges, which are like shopping mark, shopping malls for buying cryptocurrencies, bazaars, Bitcoin bazaars, right? And the way these governments are going, um, I mean, it could happen that you could get prosecuted for using Bitcoin. Yeah, you could. That, yeah. That's possible in the future, the way that you can get prosecuted for having something on your computer that you're reading, yeah. that you haven't even yeah. passed on to anybody, right? Then, not with privacy cryptos. Okay. So Pirate Chain. And I go to full disclosure, I'm part of the crew of Pirate Chain. It's a volunteer-run, fully decentralized privacy cryptocurrency, limited supply, faster than Bitcoin to transact with, cheaper than Bitcoin to transact with, because you pay a little fee every time you send um, any cryptocurrency. 
it's completely, completely private. You can send me X amount of pirate chain, only you and I will know. Nobody can see which address you sent it to. Nobody can see how much you sent it or when you sent it. It is as good as cash. It is as good as transacting in person with gold or silver. Now, the other privacy crypto is Monero, which has been going much longer, launched in 2014. And Pirate Chain was launched in August 2018. In my opinion, Pirate Chain is way more secure, way more private. It's just not as well known as Monero, but it's doing pretty, pretty well. And it's much, much cheaper. Um, so Monero, Monero and Pirate Chain, privacy cryptos. So, you know, you give me 20 euros in cash. Nobody knows, except you and I. Same deal with Pirate Chain, same deal with Monero. And that. OK, so worth okay. playing, worth just having a go, play with. I mean. Is there a limit or not a limit, but is there um, a base amount that you, you can put in? Can you put a fiver in? Can you put 20 yeah. quid in? Or that's the other thing. About, yeah, that's the other thing about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is divisible to eight decimal points. OK, so right now, Bitcoin is about twenty seven thousand dollars. But you can buy a dollar's worth or ten dollars worth or twenty dollars worth or one hundred dollars worth. You know, one of the best ways if you're going to invest once you've done your due diligence and satisfied yourself and got a secure way of keeping it known as hardware wallets or paper wallets, you can buy a little bit every week and keep adding to it. You know, like buy a little bit of gold every week, buy a little bit of silver every week, buy a little bit of Bitcoin or pirate chain every week. Not a bad idea. We all Not need our idea. runaway money, don't we, at this point? It's like yes. it's very important. Now, yeah. uh, Rich, I'm so happy we've had this conversation um, because, yeah, I was confusing, I will say, uh, I was confusing Bitcoin with the CBDC system so i and I, I say i'm not the only one who's doing that and i had this kind of just a funny vibe you know when i hear crypto it's like no cash is king and that's that and i think you know we we have to keep an open mind on things so it's been really really interesting um i'd certainly if i could find some money <laughs> uh, i think it is worth giving it a shot but i wouldn't i'd never advise anybody when it comes to money i'm certainly no financial advisor i think we all have to do, you know it's like with the vaccine we have to do our own research and we have to reach our own conclusions and it's a really big thing now isn't it where you, you can't let somebody spoon feed you the information you know yeah. you've given us what your perspective on it and now it's up to each and every one of us you know if you want go and investigate further if it doesn't suit you don't do it if you think you might be willing to throw a few bob in try it but nobody's making you do it Nobody's making it. That's really, really important. We can't rely on the mainstream media. They smear Bitcoin because they don't want us transacting with cryptocurrencies. They want us in their fiat currency system and they want us in their digital CBDC slave system. Because what, what that is. And cryptocurrencies are our gateway to independent finance because they're decentralized and can't be controlled by a central entity. Okay, well, listen, I've got two fellas here uh, looking for their dinner. So I'm going to have to go and make some dinner and have a think about this Bitcoin malarkey uh, and let it process. So thank you. Thank you so much for talking me through and talking thank us through. Because it's really important to keep that open mind and uh, to question everything. So thank you so much. And comments and questions in the description below. And this is going to go out on our separate channels. And I really appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you so much. All right, Rich. Take care. Bye-bye.